My name is Judith Raum. I am a painter. I studied painting at the Städelschule in Frankfurt am Main in Germany. But I also studied philosophy, art history and psychoanalysis. I went to New York to continue my studies of fine art and completed a master in both fields. As a consequence, my artistic practice is twofolded, I would say. I have a strong uh, studio practice, but I also do a lot of research and concentrate on different subjects that interest me, mostly uh, on social and economic history in times and contexts of colonial power. And I do also lecture performances and appear as a performer on stage in order to develop certain narratives that work better on stage than in installations. What's important for my practice also as a painter is to understand that I have always been very interested in the actual material quality of the paintings I'm working with and producing. And it matters for me very much um, to work with how I apply this paint, how I touch the support. You can read this with your eyes. I think the visual sense is able to translate the moments where you as a painter touched the canvas. So I think the tactile is always uh, fundamentally implied in painting already. Which options do I have when I want to avoid the brush stroke? I can use frottage techniques, so I have something in the background that I'm pressing against the canvas, and then I'm rubbing the shape through the canvas by rubbing a sponge or a, a towel that has some paint on it. I'm printing something on the canvas, so I'm touching the canvas briefly with whatever material I have at hand. And each of these touches on the canvas leaves another kind of trace. Um, so that is, I think, my relationship to the tactile. Uh, in painting, as I was never a big fan of painting as a sovereign kind of uh, trading uh, fetish that you sell in, 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 in the art market, but rather a kind of tool to get into a conversation with each other and to experience things. Um, I think that's why I got also interested in textiles. They embrace you in a very direct and different way than a painting usually does in its usual function. But then also they are embedded in a social and economic uh, context that I find very interesting and that uh, is a narrative one about industrial revolution, about capitalism, about working conditions, uh, about formal choices, about cultural codes, whatever. So it's a highly loaded um, um, medium. I was mostly fascinated at the time by uh, Michel Certeau, the French philosopher, and his practice of everyday life where he talks about ways in which people are able to individualize aspects of mass culture in their everyday practice. Under the Industrial Revolution, uh, people were submitted under large machines, let's say, under processes in which they could hardly act in an individual way. I was interested to find elements or traces of how a certain self-empowerment or certain ways of trying to do things in your own way still showed. The work's cotton pieces and also the video that belongs to the work um, are rooted in that context. So the context that I was looking at and where I had the feeling I, I find moments that totally match with uh, Sartor's ideas um, was the north of Bavaria, Franconia it's called. Um, in the 19th century, there used to be a, a widespread textile activity, textile industry, which was not so much happening in factories, but it was mostly happening at home, in the homes of individual people, very poor people. The whole region was um, specialized, let's say, um, on the production of scarves. Uh, the funny or really intriguing thing is they did not only produce for the local market, they produced for the whole world, um, something we can't imagine any, uh, anymore nowadays where we are used to um, buy cheap uh, uh, fabric produced in Bangladesh, produced in Turkey um, for our markets. Um, at the time it was the other way around. Um, in this little region in Franconia, people produced, for example, saris that were shipped to India afterwards. They produced ponchos that would go to Chile or Peru 
Um, and of course, this kind of production also fucked up local markets in these uh, respective regions. And the wages these people earned were so low that this kind of trade was cheaper than having it being produced in the countries. But the question that came up in my mind was, how did these people who were probably throughout their lifetime not in the position to even leave their county, you know, I mean, they probably didn't know much more than their own village. How did they deal with these foreign patterns when they wove a, a Turkish uh, waist belt scarf or uh, with a traditional pattern coming from the Black Sea coast? These scarves that were produced for the global market um, are exhibited in a textile museum in the city of Helmbrecht, but they don't show any pattern books there. And I asked for specifically for these pattern books because I thought maybe I can find traces of these weavers making notes to themselves or working something out, how a foreign pattern was made, uh, how they could substitute certain colors that they didn't have. And ultimately, uh, the people of the museum let me enter the attic where they stored the pattern books, which nobody had studied yet, basically, but um, no traces at all no traces of individual conceptualizing what the weavers were doing, which I guess uh, shows that first of all, these pattern books were not used by the weavers, but they were used by the people selling the ready-made scarves. So they were meant for presentation reasons. And, uh, and most probably the weavers themselves were also Ill illiterate. They couldn't read and write. Some of these weaving machines, these looms are still in the museum and in them you can when you look carefully, all of a sudden, actually see the people. So they applied small things they had at hand, a piece of cardboard or some old thread or whatever, and have all these little operations in the machine that are at times even humorous somehow. And these uh, reminded me of Michel Zato's practice of everyday life, that you have inventions in your daily activity in contrast to the big machine, like the big trade of the uh, colonial time or of capitalism, uh, the improvising moments or moments of uh, error or of failure usually aren't shown. And in these machines, uh, you could see a kind of entrepreneurship, a kind of making your living where you constantly had to deal with improvising that I found really charming. Maybe two aspects. On the one side, when I make things, paintings, drawings, the things I do with my hands, the actual processes are really visible in the artwork afterwards. It's not, I'm not a fan of works that have a kind of fetish-like character, a certain shine, genius gesture to them. Uh, I'm rather interested in ways um, that attract people to look closely and also to understand while they are looking how things were made. Um, so a rather inclusive kind of gesture. When I go in historical detail in my research, um, so many things pop up that interest me and aspects are multifaceted. So I decided to develop lecture performances in which I myself as the author of everything appear in front of the audience. So my subjectivity, my own body becomes somehow the medium um, through which I tell stories and through which I also embody uh, the voices of people I did research on and who are mute in history. And what came to my mind were the pattern books and the patterns. Some of the patterns uh, which were very specific, they actually had painterly effects in them. Also the yarns they used were imperfectly uh, twisted. So uh, fibers were coming out on, on all sides. Um, and when you wove them in a, in a complex structure, the fibers would somehow bleed into each other. And uh, what you can see here in the background is that I basically came up with a monotype uh, technique, a one-time printing technique, where I had paint applied to a board. I had a board covered with lacquer, so it had a very not open surface, not sucking in the color. And I would apply a very liquid paint on that uh, surface and then just press it on the fabric. And that creates very random structures. And the other element was creating stains and uh, something that could be read as uh, traces of work by 
printing on the fabric, washing it out so that only small amounts of uh, paint remain in the cotton and it looks, looks like uh, bleached by age as something, an old piece of fabric that you rub the machine with, with or that you clean your hands with after working. Because it was really very much about leaving me over, leaving my control over to the process.